just before we carry on, Mr. Anthony Brown, the um, law reporter from the ICLR asked if we could have the skeleton arguments because he's having difficulty hearing the submissions. I think it's the acoustic or whatever. And I, I imagine there's no difficulty with that. So. No, of course. My Lord, the point I was uh, making just before lunch concerned paragraph 36 and 37 about the judge's focus on the uh, two measures which were reformed in 1997. Um, and the point I was making is that, yes, this is a reforming and restating statute. It restates the 1989 Act and it changes it. So it would be far too narrow, even if one were go behind the wording of the statute to try and discern some sort of other policy intention, simply to look at the 97 Act without looking at the work that's gone before. It's not just about the two things that are tweaked, it's about the decisions and the balance that were struck prior to 1989 as well. So the, the, the court's focus was uh, far too narrow. <clears throat> the judge then sets out why he found support for his view that it was quite limited by referring to the points that supported the fact that indeed Parliament was trying to uh, change two respects. So unsurprisingly, in circumstances where Parliament has decided as part of the process to change two issues, so the small payments and the, the general offset, there is evidence about debate about all of that. Mm. But that's just part of the picture. And we do say there's a, there is a snapshot of material. Insurers say, well, you put that material before the judge. We did, but we did so for a different purpose, namely a high-level demonstration that Parliament has factored in a number of these points as part of its process in a way that, since the judgment, the Supreme Court has said one should do. Um, so there is then the material set out through to paragraph 49. And there is a summary from the minister, so the minister promoting the bill in the House of Lords. So making a number of points. So the first is about the pain and suffering mischief, namely that before there wasn't the correspondence, it was just a general set off against all damages, which was objectionable and the victim lost out. Everyone agrees that's wrong. And manipulation around the 2,500 pound limit. And then, uh, the, the Minister saying, I believe that the case is strong and your Lordships have agreed that the new scheme will be fairer to the victim, and then sets out some general points. So it will enable compensation for pain and suffering to be paid in full, and it will be fairer to the taxpayer by recovering all social security benefits in the cases where compensation is payable. I believe also that it will be fair to business, allowing compensation to be reduced where a corresponding benefit has been paid. So it is an extract and there's more in the evidence. But it's perfectly clear that the minister knew what he was doing. He was promoting a bill which was going to have, uh, as its principal effect, a general balance between these various competing interests. Now, as to whether other members of parliament shared those views and objectives, we don't know because they don't give reasons. Then the judgment deals with section 22 of the Act, so the, the liability of insurers. It makes a point for what it's worth that it comes in at a fairly late stage in the report stage. And then 51, during the third reading debate, Viscount Chelmsford, who was there briefed by the Association of British Insurers, he says he expressly recognised the possibility that an excess payment may be due to the state if the benefits payments exceed the loss of earnings from which a deduction could be made. So that is the complaint that the insurers make, what they describe as excess payment beyond the credit. And that was known to Parliament. Mm. And paragraph 52, when it goes back to the Commons on the 25th of February 1997, the minister there, Mr Peter Lilly, including reference to the reforms, applying to cases settled from the date of implementation, including those in the pipeline. Otherwise, two accident victims in similar circumstances could receive different compensation on the same day simply because their claims were not initiated at the same time. 
a similar statement was made by the junior minister. This is not quite no retrospection. When the, animal, or when the accident occurred as immaterial, we will catch claims if they're in the pipeline. That's the point, as I've explained it. It's a, a limited retrospectivity, because it doesn't claw back things that have already been paid out, requires going forward, but it necessarily bites on policies and liabilities that existed at the time. So the Lords knew about it, the Commons knew about it. What they did not know, because they could not know, is what's in the future. So fair child, etc. But there, they, uh, it is clear that when they refer to the pipeline, they're talking about a pipeline of cases. That necessarily means, though, that it's cases in respect of injuries that have already happened, at least in part. And therefore, to that limited extent, there's going to be retrospectivity. And what the judge seems to interpret that, what it's worth later, being a pipeline means something else, namely the cases that are, be, that are in contemplation at the moment, as opposed to the whole long tail book. But what we say, you can probably take from that, if admissible, which it probably isn't, is that the Act faithfully implements what the ministers who were promoting it wanted to achieve. The court then explains the effects of the Act, as I have done already, so we don't need to go over that again. But then in paragraph 61, the court says this, the 1997 Act thus aims to rectify the flaws referred to in paragraph 36 above. The small payments cap is removed and the compensator is now able to deduct the benefit related sum only against specific heads of special damage payable to the injured person. If the recoverable benefit has no corresponding head of special damage or exceeds it, then the compensator is nonetheless liable to pay sums to the state that are not matched by corresponding deduction from the compensation payment. As a result, benefit-related deductions can no longer be made from sums due to injured persons in respect of general damages, but compensators remain liable to the state for the benefits payable to the injured party. So, insofar as the judge is saying at the beginning of 61, it deals with the two limited issues about small payments and general set-off, that is true. But the judge acknowledges in the balance of paragraph 61 that in fact it goes further and it sets out general principles of excess liability, as it were, or excess payments. In 62, the court says, this move from a purely deduction-based system to one where the compensator has a freestanding liability to the defendant resulted from and achieves the objective of avoiding the iniquity of unfair deductions from compensation, it does not, on the evidence I have seen, reflect any broader intention or consensus regarding the shifting of long-tail liabilities away from the state and onto groups of compensators or their insurers. We say that is highly problematic. What does the court mean by broader intention? Because the intention is in the act. And we know that the Act does exactly that. So what is this intention? It must be what I'm describing as the views of the 1997 lawmakers. So what was in their mind, as opposed to what the statute says on an always speaking basis? So that was the wrong target. That's an important sentence, though, isn't it? It is, yes. It, it reveals the error. Well, Namely, to the judgment wrong, because he, because he judged how you construe the statute by reference to, to the narrow, specific matters that were expressly discussed. Yes. Which, I, which ignores two things, doesn't it? It ignores the overall point, if you like, which is all, that, that one is looking at what, what does the statute intend upon its correct interpretation, um, not at what the lawmakers may or may not have discussed at the time. And the second point is that um, really following on from that, we don't know. Because, for example, we don't have the discussion in committee about the contrib. We don't know what was going through the minds of individual um, lords or, or, or peers or MPs, whether anybody thought about you know, more detailed things. Yes. Whether somebody had said, because these sort of, this you know, asbestosis claims were already well and truly in the pipeline, um, 
certainly in the United States and by 1997 in this jurisdiction as well. Absolutely. So who knows what was, what was being contemplated by the people who, who actually legislated? Yes. But none of that's admissible. Not admissible. Contrary to Article 9 of the Bill of Rights, for good reason, mm. Parliament doesn't have to give reasons. So, as a, can I summarise it? I hope that you say paragraph 62 reveals the judge's error. Yes. You say it's not admissible, but you, you were the party that adduced this material. My, my Lord, what we did was to provide Mr Towers' witness statement which says there has been consideration, and in very summary terms, uh, referred to the debates in the House of Lords, <coughs> which expressly dealt with the point. And, and exhibited it. And exhibited uh, our so error. If, if, if one's being fairly brutal about it, it highlights in your mouth to say that it's not admissible. You're perfectly entitled to say the judge has used it for the wrong purpose. Yes. That is different. But um, it was not exactly helpful for the Secretary of State or um, to um, put material before Parliament and then blame the judge for reading it. That much I said. The word admissibility is not the correct word because it's admissible on a judicial review claim. Um, we thought we were being helpful, but in hindsight we were not because what we ended up putting before the judge is material which not only led him into error, but is material he shouldn't really, in fact, have been using for that purpose. Now, I, I, we didn't know that the judge would use it for the purpose he did, namely to try and discern some other intention beyond the statute. What we thought was helpful was that it did, in fact, show that <coughs> there has been very extensive consideration of precisely the points. So it's either admissible for you and everyone else, or it's not. Yes. Uh, you say admissible is the wrong word. Yes. Is, it, is your submission this material is admissible or not? Well, it, it is admissible in that it can be properly adduced into the evidence, uh, evidence before the court. So it's admissible? Yes, it's admissible. What it can't be do, uh, what can't happen is the court cannot use it. Well, can't misuse it for an improper purpose. Yes. Indeed. Can't use it for any purpose other than the very narrow one identified by the Supreme Court in SC. Which is a well, high... convenient moment, Mr Brown, show us what the Supreme Court said about it. Yes. Yes, of course. Um, so, if I can invite the court, then to turn it up. <coughs> so, chapter fifty-five of the authorities bundle. I think it's the last one. Yes, yeah. that's one of the cases. Um, <coughs> seven judge, Supreme Court, judgment given by the President, Lord Reed with whom Lord Hodge, Lord Lord Jones, Lord Kitchen, Lord Sales, Lord Stevens, and Lady Black agreed. Um, My Lord have it. It's behind tab 55. Yeah, sorry. It's important for this case in two respects. <coughs> First, the issue of the intensity of review question, yeah. which is effectively a, a, a sort of preliminary issue. The court's yeah. got to decide what level of review it's going to adopt before yeah. it considers the measure. And then secondly, the use of parliamentary materials in the Bill of Rights. Well, you, you come back to the, to the intensity of review question. Show us what the review says about the use of parliamentary materials. Yes. Um, so that is at 163. Yeah. So what one sees there then is that in SC, so social security litigation, the parties there had also referred to materials that were before parliament. In 164, the Supreme Court records the Bill of Rights and the privileges conferred on Parliament. In section 165, the Court makes the point that the role of this Court is not to supervise what Parliament has done, broadly speaking. And we say that, therefore, the role of the court is not to inquire as to whether Parliament has contemplated properly or negligently 
something in the future. So what is described there is the objection to externally imposed criteria by which the quality of the process in Parliament is being measured. And we say that's precisely our case because the insurers say and the judge found that it is necessary or Parliament should be properly criticised for not having contemplated what came in the future. Or putting it more neutrally, Parliament didn't contemplate all of that and therefore that's a factor which goes to fair balance. Then 166, point about the difference between government and parliament. But this is a passage which is an extremely important one from the judgment, which makes good the points that I made earlier, which is one has to understand what the nature of parliamentary process involves. There are murky compromises, but there's, that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. You can't read much into all of that. Then, importantly, final sentence of 166, the reasons uh, which the government gives for promoting legislation cannot therefore be treated as necessarily explaining why Parliament chose to enact it. So the fact that Lord Mackay is saying various things are all well and good, but they tell you nothing about what the parliamentarians themselves were looking to achieve. And for all we know, they'd seen the pleadings in Fairchild and they were delighted by the act as a way of reversing all of that and recovering a better or, or different amount of money. We don't know. It's complete speculation. And 167, critical point, two other aspects of parliamentary proceedings are important in this context. First, the will of Parliament finds expression solely in the legislation which it enacts. Parliament does not give reasons for enacting legislation. It simply votes on a motion to approve a proposed legislative text. There is no corporate statement of reasons, and the individual members of Parliament do not give their reasons for voting in a particular way. Lord Hobhouse said in Wilson, not part of the duty of any member of Parliament to provide or state definitively in Parliament the justification for legislation which the legislature is content to pass. <clears throat> so the reasons, such as they are in the debates, are irrelevant. Mm. 168, Parliament is not just a debating chamber. can't use this evidence gathering process which the court has used here as the framework for considering proceedings in Parliament. It's not about me evidencing matters. I bear no burden, evidential or otherwise, because that's not part of the process here. This is about simply in the first instance and subject to the point about a, a rationality challenge and how that interacts. In the first instance, one simply looks at the statute and the camera is not a phrase I've come across before. That means what it says. Is it in outside? Bars. What, yes. sorry? In, in, the, in the bars of Westminster. Right. Mm. That's Extra where the camera. real decisions were made. In the bars of Westminster. Right. <laughs> yes. I put it sl slightly uh, flippantly. But, but that, you have to be careful about that because these are live stream proceedings. And one of the, the objections for Article 9 is to stop courts in calling into question what happens in Parliament in the same way that Parliament mustn't call into question what happens in court. And that, I mean, one understands the submissions, but um, that is exactly why Article 9 is enacted, yes. to ensure that, you know, it's not too lightly taken as much. In, indeed. It, it, uh, where, the, where does this all take us, just as a matter of interest? I mean, we're being told here what we can't do. Well, it's a ground of appeal for a start, so I... I no, I mean, what I mean is... Where, where does Lord Reed get to right. in terms of what you can do? No, perfectly proper. Um, he, he does, uh, and I'll come to that. So 169, mm -hmm. and I'm happy just to... It, it's 173 and 174. Yes. 173, yeah. okay. The, the, I don't want um, it to be thought that I'm stepping over any part of this extremely important judgment. No, no I'm, I'm speaking for myself, I read it anyway for a different reason last week, so it's fairly familiar. Yes. 
Um, so 171, very important about this not being a judicial model of rationality. 172, parliamentary intention is a legal construct, not an empirical construct. <coughs> it's not about looking for evidence. And see what it says on countryside alliance there. Might be completely different from what the promoters of the bill had in mind. Then 173 and 174, considerable care. If one just unpicks this then by reference to Wilson, uh, so picking it up about 10 lines down or four lines from the foot of the page, in carrying out the evaluation, the court had to compare the effect of the legislation with the convention right. Sorry, where are you? Sorry, um, Malay, I'm four lines up from the bottom of 2307 in paragraph 173. Thank you. Carry out the evaluation, the court had to compare the effect of the legislation with the convention right. If the legislation impinged on a convention right, the court must compare the policy objective of the legislation with the policy objective, which under the convention might justify a prima facie infringement of the convention right. So that this is the point here. The legislation does what it says on the statute, as done since 97. Here, in 2021, the arguments have moved on because the insurers say, well, this statute interferes with my convention rights in the, in the following respect. My case and the burden here on, on the Secretary of State is to say, that's the legislation. That is the interference as it manifests itself in 2021. I justify the prima facie interference with A1P1 for the following reasons then set out what those reasons are. And what the, the judge or what the court is doing then is considering the statute, considering what I am advancing as a justification defence, and then it's applying its appropriate proportionality evaluation. And to that extent, as set out in paragraph 174, classic proportionality test which we'll come back to, and it is legitimate and permissible to that limited extent when considering proportionality to have a look at the parliamentary debates and other parliamentary material for the reasons given by Lord Nichols in 174 and 175 the words to that limited extent so if I invite the court just to read that There is nothing wrong with looking to discern, for example, aspects of social policy to that limited extent insofar as they're relevant and bear upon the balancing exercise. That is fine. But beyond that, it's rather difficult um, to see 176, what is said about parliamentary privilege, So 176, 1 and 2, 2, cardinal constitutional principle of the will of Parliament is expressed in the legislation. Proportionality is to be judged on that basis. The legislation is the will of Parliament. So ignore the subjective states of mind. See paragraph 3. And then the point that's italicised in 3, lack of cogent justification in the course of parliamentary debate is not a matter which counts against the legislation on issues of proportionality. The court is called upon to evaluate the proportionality of the legislation, not the adequacy of the reasons. And then 177 and 178, the parliamentary material can be, is to be used 
relatively rarely. And what is said, um, so four lines up from the bottom of 2309, so at H in paragraph 178. But even the older cases raise the question whether, when the court is considering whether a legislative provision is a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim, the fact that Parliament can be seen to have been aware of the various interests involved and can therefore be taken to have considered how a balance should be struck between them can legitimately be taken into account. And then see what is said of a countryside allowance, alliance, etc. And then I won't read it out, but reading through to 183, court there is making the point that the, the limited extent here is that you can look at the social policy that might be helpfully considered by reference to debates in Parliament. That's very limited use. You can also look at the specific consideration of the impact on the affected party, because if it has been debated by Parliament, that may well be a factor. But beyond that, your room is really very limited indeed. And then even if you're doing that, even if you are considering, well, did Parliament actually know how problematic this would be for the liability insurance industry, you do it at a high level. So see paragraph 183. It's important to add two caveats. First, the court should go no further than ascertaining whether matters relevant to compatibility were raised during the legislative process, if they're to avoid assessing the adequacy or cogency of Parliament's consideration of them, contrary to Lord Nicholls' third principle. So what we say we did properly was put before the court evidence that indeed it had been considered. So you, you, you say you, you used it for limited, two limited uses you say are yes. acceptable, namely one, social policy, and two, was the impact of affected parties considered. Yes. But, but we're not purporting to go beyond that, but you say the judge no. then went, went beyond that. Yes, because the error we made was rather than just having the limited extracts on Hansard, we had more material, which was in fact still targeting the same two points, but in fact then allowed for a train of inquiry. Well, look at what they were saying on Thursday afternoon in 1995 about this, that and the other. Well, what the judge has done is exactly what Lord Lee says you shouldn't do, which is to focus on what the minister said well, um, expressly and turn that into effectively the parliamentary intention being limited in some way, whereas the reality is that the parliamentary intention is discerned from the statute, and the highest it can be put is that there was some consideration of the impact of these matters. Yes, he has done that, um, but I, I do say he's done other things which are objectionable, which is knowing that Parliament has actually considered retroactivity, retrospectivity here, and excess liabilities. He's basically said, well, I still... Um, uh, thinking that that was effectively an, not, in fact, the basis for Parliament doing what it did. Um, so he, he seems to have basically rejected the parliamentary debates on the point as opposed to merely acknowledging them. Okay. This might be a convenient time to deal with the other parts of SC as well, about standard of review. Sorry, my lord, I appreciate you've just yep, put okay. it away. Mm -hmm. um, So the, the other issue is um, the court's got then a, on its face, interfering provision in the form of the statute, and it has the state and the Secretary of State advancing an argument as to why that is justifiable for A1, B1 purposes. Um, the starting point has to be what is the level of scrutiny that I am going to apply to this? having regard to the authorities, because um, as SC indicates, and I'll show the court, that is effectively the first stage in the process. So it's, it's a species of a preliminary issue. In our case, the judge never actually says what the standard of review is that he is applying. So that is our criticism. What he appears to do is substitute. He, he, he determines it for himself, 
rather than reviewing the Secretary of State's um, judgment on the matters. That's the first error. The second error is that even if he had properly directed himself to reviewing my case, he needed to apply the manifestly without reasonable foundation test or something thereabouts. Because the, the options before the court are manifestly without reasonable foundation, effectively sitting at one end of the spectrum. There's possibly even a, a yet uh, higher uh, threshold beyond that, as I'll show the court in a moment. So an even lower level of review, perhaps. So that's one end of the spectrum. And then towards the other end of the spectrum is something like weighty reasons, i.e. you've really got to have something substantial to justify that. And where the court pitches its review will depend on all of the factors. That's the conclusion of SC. But um, there are a number of indicators which should direct a court in the case of what we describe as social policy legislation mm -hmm towards an outcome whereby the review standard is essentially manifestly without reasonable foundation, because that reflects the Strasbourg case law. Um, so th there's a point that's taken in footnote 10 of the insurer's skeleton, where they say rather ambitiously that manifestly without reasonable foundation is applicable only in Article 14 discrimination cases. And this is an Article 14 discrimination case. Well, that, that's not right. But uh, Darby is an example of, I think it's Darby, one of, I thought there, there certainly are cases where it's been applied outside the context of Article 14. Th there are. It originates from James and UK, which yeah. is an A1P1 case, leasehold and franchisement. Yeah. So that is not an Article 14 case. Um, there are plenty of cases. I, if I may, in the interest of time, simply say what they are They're in the bundle. So, PI, which is authorities tab 30, C paragraph 7483. So, that applies manifestly without reasonable foundation, MWRF, to a pure A1P1 case. And back, that's authorities tab 25, C paragraph 53. And note, please, paragraph 68, which we'll have to come back to, which says, perfectly fine to do it retrospectively if that's your legitimate policy objective. And see, most recently, um, the two cases that I've handed up. So one of them's a judgment of Mr. Justice Bourne in the Administrative Court dealing with an Article 1, Protocol 1 case, and it doesn't appear to be being debated, but there manifestly without reasonable foundation is the right approach. But also an, a Strasbourg case, Christian Religious Organisation of Jehovah's Witnesses in Armenia. And there it's paragraphs 45 and 50. So 45... So this is A1P1. This is about a tax levy on a religious organisation for certain products they're selling. So 45, particularly wide margin, and then 50. Having stated that, the court arguably or possibly goes even further still, so seven lines down, Furthermore, insofar as the taxpayer is concerned, the court's well-established position is that states may be afforded some degree of additional deference and latitude in the exercise of their fiscal functions under the lawfulness test. I don't that, that's Strasbourg reviewing national authorities. Yes. Rather than, as we are, a national uh, part of government reviewing another part of government, the judicial reviewing the uh, legislature. Indeed, but my submission based on ASC is that effectively one ends up in the same place, not inevitably, because the court may well be in a position whereby it, it for various reasons, considers that a more intense uh, level of review would be justified on the facts of the case. But no. where, what, what do we get? Um, which paragraphs do you want to look at in Mr Justice Bourne? So 40, oh, in Mr Justice Bourne, um, it is dealt with in a section... Uh, so 135, 
is the bit about Article 1, Protocol 1. And then 137, the margin of appreciation manifestly without reasonable foundation. And then 138, referring to JCWI. Um, so I, I accept my Lord Lord Justice Dingleman's point, it's not specifically dealing with the fact that there may be a, a nuance between the supranational level and the national level. What in fact the court does here in this particular A1P1 simpliciter challenge, i.e. non-discrimination challenge, is apply manifestly without reasonable foundation as the correct test. The same arises as a matter of pure domestic law. So Bank Mellat is in fact common law rationality and there the Supreme Court apply an approach which is properly described as manifestly without reasonable foundation. And Bank Mellat at tab 36, Lord Sumption makes the point at paragraph 26 that that's correct because interferences with business assets are not in the same category as disputes about human values. So pure A1P1 cases, particularly when one is in the second paragraph, we're looking at collection of taxes and contributions, is a matter which is generally one where the level of intensity is very low. Not inevitably, particularly if combined with Article 14, might be factors that warrant a different approach. <coughs> but there are no such factors here. There's no singling out, like in Bank Mellet. No allegation of discrimination. You said, you said um, that the judge did not say what standard of review he was applying, and I'm not sure that's quite fair. If one looks at paragraph 68 of the judgment, page 172, so he appears to accept that a manifestly unreasonable approach is engaged at one to three, but not at four. Well, that's quite, it's difficult to read that, because I appreciate, my lady, that that's one interpretation. Um, but if that were right, one would expect him at sta stages one to three, when he comes on to deal with it, to say, I stand back and ask myself whether it's manifestly without reasonable foundation. And he doesn't. What the judge actually does is just say what he thinks is right in respect of all of those three limbs. So we only have one reference to MWRF there, and that appears to be in the context about whether or not it applies at the fourth stage. I, I said in my skeleton argument and talents notice that we, we thought it was common ground that at stages one to three it was applicable. The insurers in their skeleton argument say no, it's not not manifestly without reasonable foundation, even at stages one to three, it's something more intense. So they interpret the judgment the other way around, as being that it's, it's up for debate at one to three as well as four. But um, just drawing together what we've got, we've got a number of Strasbourg cases, of which most recent Jobe's Witness case is dealing with it in the context of tax, and tax sits adjacent to contributions in the structure of A1P1, and we say, therefore, an, an analogous approach applies. And they are all saying that you apply MWRF. Start with James in the UK. That's a consistent pattern of the Strasbourg case law. We do have purely domestic cases, Bank Mellet and, indeed, the Welsh Bill, subject to the point about the fourth limb of the stage, uh, in which the Supreme Court is saying that for a property rights case, you apply manifestly without reasonable foundation. And, we, and there is explanation which accords with common sense, namely that given by Lord Sumption at paragraph 26, namely that what we are looking at here is business assets, and I am not in any way uh, de denigrating the importance of such assets in our society, but we're not looking at human values here. That is an important point and one can considers the standard of review on what Parliament can properly do. Now, SC then is a discrimination case, um, and therefore there is a detailed analysis of whether the 
MWF starting point shifts by reference to different types of protective characteristics or statuses for Article 14 for purposes. But it's not, it's not limited to that. And if I can, just in the interest of saving time, just take from the summary at paragraph 115 then. There's a number of factors affecting the width of the margin of appreciation, which can arise from the circumstances, the subject matter, and the background. Notwithstanding that complexity, some general points can be identified. So this is an issue which is informed by principle. It's not purely discretionary. The court just decides anything on the day. It has to be guided by the principles that emerge from the case law. And of those 115 subparagraph 2, there is a wide margin in cases of economic or social strategy. And taxation is given as an example we say that the obvious other example, given that it sits next to tax in the structure of A1P1, is contributions of this nature. And the concluding sentence then in subparagraph two is that MWRF is generally the applicable test. So the court can be confident that that is subject to any special factors the approach, are there any such special factors? We say, well, no, and indeed the other factors all reinforce the conclusion that it's manifestly without reasonable foundation. So 115.3, are there common standards? So across the other 47 contracting states, do they have a scheme which matches some notion or national law? And is the UK the outlier? There's nothing to suggest that the UK is the outlier in what it's doing. And then a wide variety of factors that might impact on the margin. Sorry, but it says the existence or absence of common standards. Is there any suggestion that there are common standards here? No, we, no one knows what other contracting states do in terms of recovery of benefits. But the, the absence of common standards can also be relevant. Yes. So it is the position we just don't know, or do we know there is the existence or absence? You know, we don't know. So uh, in a, uh, it could be said that's neutral, but I, I would say that, in fact, what this really means is that if, if there is a very clear emergence of a particular human rights mischief, as it were, uh, that is recognised by contracting states and one has an outlier in terms of its treatment, then that might be a factor to bear into consideration. So there's some legacy problem with historic legislation and the UK has not brought it into line with international thinking. Well, that's the point that's really being addressed, isn't it? It's yes, it, it is. But what I'm really saying is there's, n there's no additional factor here which would point the court away from MWRF <laughs> other than the, uh, they reinforce it because our overarching submission is that there are no right or wrong answers here. It's a complex balancing exercise. And if one recognises and accepts that as the starting point, the fact that there is uh, scope for legitimate disagreement as to where to strike the balance is priced in to manifestly without reasonable foundation, is recognised. What the insurers need to show then is that is precisely that. It's manifestly without reasonable foundation. It simply could not be done. So th there is good reason why, on the balanced approach described at 116, 117 onwards, in cases of social policy, not just social security, manifestly without reasonable foundation is the applicable test. And the reasons originate from STEC, which are set out in paragraph 117. What is said in Steck itself is a point repeated frequently because of their direct knowledge of their society and its needs. The national authorities are in principle better placed than the international judge 
to appreciate what is in the public interest on social or economic grounds, and the court would generally respect the legislature's policy choice unless it is manifestly without reasonable foundation. Transposing that to my Lord Lord Justice Stingerman's note to the, the national level, the same logic is applicable here, that we are still talking about social and economic decisions being made by the sovereign parliament. We are not concerned with areas where there will be anxious scrutiny by the court, such as discrimination on core protected grounds. So the logic of STEC applies equally when one's considering the constitutional balance as between the court and parliament here. Then the court goes on to make the points, perhaps again, if I can just note the um, paragraphs 129, so we would emphasise paragraphs two and three, really repeats points I've already made. 142, there has to be a balanced approach to this issue. And on that balanced approach, all of the pointers point to MWRF. And 143, specifically in responsive to my Lord, which is Stingerman's point, domestic courts, is an analogous approach reflected then in terms of what the domestic court does. And there's a few points here. The first is, well, it's the same if all other points are the same. So it's still manifestly without reasonable foundation if we're looking at an economic or social strategic decision, particularly one not involving singling out or discrimination. That's the first point. The second point is the other principle. To some extent, the court has to consider whether the Strasbourg court would consider the measure to violate A1B1, because if there's nothing to suggest that Stra Strasbourg would consider there to be a violation, then this court should go no further. So the obligation under other is to go no further, no less. And there is nothing, we say, which would indicate that the Strasbourg court would consider the absence of a matching scheme to violate A1B1. There's no case law to that effect. Appreciate that's not the end of the matter, but there's nothing that one can detect in the jurisprudence of Strasbourg, which suggests that that is mandated by A1B1. Paragraph 144, we say that has powerful resonance here. Domestic courts have to respect the separation of powers between the judiciary and the elected branches of government. They therefore have to accord appropriate respect to the choices made in the field of social and economic policy by the government and parliament, whilst at the same time providing a safeguard against unjustifiable discrimination. I appreciate that's in the context of discrimination. The same logic applies. And then it is right, and we accept and have always accepted that this is amenable to a view. We're not saying it isn't, but one has to approach it properly in respecting the constitutional uh, boundaries. And then see, please, 146, points about suspect grounds, etc., none of which in fact arises, but that's when you start retreating from MWRF. And then if I can emphasize what is said between F and H of paragraph 146 without reading it all out. But these are not new principles. This is something that is a feature of domestic judicial review too, because it's a manifestation of constitutional principle. And then, for what it's worth, the conclusion goes through to paragraph 161 in the particular case and in most social security cases, it will be NWLRF, notwithstanding the fact that they necessarily involve discrimination because social security by na its nature is discriminatory. And 
true it is, this isn't about distribution of benefits. This is the, the other side of the coin. This is about bringing in revenues into the state rather than distributing them. There's no difference, particularly in that regard, in terms of the discretion that should be afforded to Parliament as to how best to do that. That's all I'm proposing to say about SC, but we do say that that does reveal the, the, the problems with the judge's approach here. And if I can just then make my criticisms by reference to the way that the judge goes about Article 1, paragraph 150, paragraph 111, really. So the structure is right in terms of how one approaches the challenge. One that looks at the interference, and we didn't take a point and don't take a point that there is no prima facie interference with the, the general business assets of the insurers. Of course there is, they're obliged to make a payment. So no, no issue there. Legitimate aim is a paragraph 115 And what the court records at paragraph 115 is part of the defendant's detailed grounds, but only part. So the actual detailed grounds are in tab 24. Sorry, what 24? Uh, tab 24 of the ah, core yes, bundle. Yes, yes, thank you. We do say that it is necessary to have a look at the case we were in fact advancing because the court effectively says that's not your legitimate aim. Your legitimate aim is something else. Have you just looked at the tab 24? Yes. Paragraph 44. So the legitimate aim, which is the case that the Secretary of State is advancing, is that paragraph 44, legitimate aim, it's an instrument of social policy, ensures the state can recover a contribution of costs that is incurred in tort visas and the EL insurance industry generally meets costs attributable to tortious wrongdoing and increases the amount of public resources available generally and thereby furthers the community interest. In paragraph 45, which the judge doesn't record in, in the judgment, sets out further aspects of that. Namely that it is indeed interference in the markets, that there's a bit of a quid pro quo here, you have the benefit of compulsory EL insurance. You give back an exchange. That's not the legitimate aim. That's just a statement of the details. Well, we, we would say that the legitimate aim can be properly encapsulated as being effectively a compromise, as it were, between different competing interests. But that's a very high-level summary. What we're trying to communicate here is the, uh, the basis for that legitimate aim, why it effectively it's legitimate. But you're not saying your legitimate aim is other than accurately set out in paragraph 44? I'm saying that 40, paragraph 45 is a summary and that it needs to be read in context with what follows on, which would be other aspects of the legitimacy, as it were, of but the aim. Just following up on my Lord's point, is that, look at the word further, isn't 44 the your statement of legitimate aim? Well, 44 is a summary of the aim, and what follows is the further reasons as to why it's, in the view of the Secretary of State, a legitimate aim. Is it? So, what, so taking those factors into account, why is it legitimate to do what the state does? And they, what really is being said is, well, there, there are factors which justify it, effectively. Um, and 
it needs to address particular mischiefs. So the, the two criticisms that were advanced are retrospectivity and additional liabilities without credit. We say they are probably part of the legitimate end because the, the response of Parliament is to deal with those two. So why is it legitimate to apply this retrospectively? And the point is, well, it, it's not going to deal with the issue that Parliament's trying to deal with here if it's only prospective, for the reasons set out in 47.1 in summary. What is wrong with the formulation of legitimate aim at 115? It's too narrow. It's aim, but it doesn't... The trouble is, all, these four, all four points overlap, as the courts have said, more than once. They do. And, and the points you make in one, one, uh, sorry, in paragraph 45 could, could be thought to be more... more if you, you know, look at them in terms of fair balance, that they are certainly the first, second... Well, all of them, I think. First, second, third... And proportionality. And then. proportionality generally. So... Well, my, my criticism is... I'd understood or misunderstood your case to be that your legitimate aim was, was what it is in paragraph 44, and the judge was wrong to say that that wasn't a legitimate aim. Yeah, that, that, that is a true gravity. Well, and that, may I say, is much easier to follow. Uh, yeah. that, that is the true gravity of my complaint, is that the, the judge at 118 said that is not your legitimate aim, when in fact... That is my legitimate aim, and it's very difficult to know what to do with that. Because and in terms of proportionality or fair balance, how have one described it? You say, well, the judge has failed to take proper account of, of the countervailing factors, some of which you've identified in paragraph 45. Yes. I mean, the, the problem is he, he has rejected, as he just says uh, at 118, the submission on legitimate aim. But it isn't a submission. It, it is a case. He can say it's not legitimate. That's open to him. But he can't say that the state is, in fact, not relying on the reasons that it gives. One way it's your best view, Dr. Yes. A, one, a, an example of substitution. Yes, exactly. So the judge says, well... <laughs> it's not a submission, it's a statement. It's a statement. It's my case. It's a bit like saying, well, I don't have eight grounds of appeal, I've only got three. Um, and not only that, but three of the grounds of appeal are something different from what you put on the piece of paper. I mean, that's not... Um, how this works. I advance my legitimate aim, and he holds that to the fire and decides whether it's legitimate or not. You can't say it's not your legitimate aim, you're actually up to something completely different. So that's my main point, and I accept that that may well be the more straightforward point. And, and that then sets the judge off on the wrong path, because everything is then tested by reference to a different legitimate aim from that, in fact, being advanced in response to this complaint. Do, do insurers, as it were, reject that they uh, make the positive case that they did not accept as a matter of fact that that was your client's aim? Yes, but this is their case because the, the judgment adopts everything the insurers argue. They, they argued in the statement of facts and grounds your legitimate aim is what is disclosed by the, I see. Yes. Disclosed by the 1997 Act, material underpinning it. In other words, they, they were saying they were effectively uh, putting forward a case that the judge accepts in paragraph 118. Yes. This is, this is all just material. to do with the yes. two... Um, By reference to the debate. The limited... They aspect. say, no, ignore the Secretary of State's case and ignore Mr Tower's witness statement. You can't take that into account. What you look at is what the lawmakers were saying in Hansard in 1997. And that's repeated in their skeleton argument on this appeal. Maybe they're saying that's all it's subjective, it's described as my case, and inadmissible. And what is very not subjective is what they were saying in 1997. The difficulty, the difficulty is, as I see it, that the judge's approach in 118 overlooks or ignores the fact that, that um, the 1997 Act was preceded by the 1989 Act. Indeed. Which, for all its faults, undoubtedly had the same legitimate aim as is identified in paragraph 115. Absolutely so. So, you, know, you might say, going right way back to the 1948 Act. Yes. So this, is, this has been the legitimate aim of the, of the state in these areas of, of welfare yes. since beverage. Yes. 
that is absolutely right, and that is my fundamental complaint about legitimate aim. Um, narrow, doesn't properly grapple with the actual case, and it sets up a, an, an impossible position for, for my client, because they say, well, you look at 1997 and what the lawmakers were doing, the gravity of the complaint is about something that happened. Because they did not and could not know that, then you're stuck. Um, because you can't justify your legitimate aim because the lawmakers couldn't see the future. Uh, I'm sorry to worry away at this. Um, but I'm anxious to get this right in my own mind. I'm looking at Mr. Kent, up to Mr. Kent's skeleton below, at page 319 of the bundle, and paragraphs 35 to 38, he deals with legitimate aim. And I don't see him uh, saying, ignore Mr. Towers, look at the Hansard material. Um, it's in his skeleton argument for the appeal, but what I would be... So I'm just wondering, I'm trying to work out how the judge... Sorry, what page are you looking at? Page 319. I think, Mr. Kent, am I right? This is your skeleton. Yeah. Skeleton the hearing before, before the judge. The, before the judge, yeah. Um, and refers to the paragraph you've just taken us to in more detailed grounds of resistance. It says, we accept that these aims are legitimate per se. So he's not attacking the, the statement of the aim, he's attacking the legitimacy of the Just saying it's not, it, but they're not, it's set against the other four, the other remaining two Bank Mellat factors. It's not good enough. Um, so I'm trying to... I'm, yeah, he makes the point of paragraph 38, which is exactly the point I've just made to you. Yes. That what you've got in paragraph 45, the detailed grounds, is more um, apt to the third and fourth. So you... Anyway. But I think my, my lady's point is that, that um, the insurers don't seem to have been saying, well, actually, no, your legitimate aim is something different. completely different from the narrow. Well, uh, they may not have been. I'm saying your aim was, as you allege it, to be, but it wasn't legitimate. <laughs> well, that's normally what one would. I mean, well, I, well, I say normally. It's actually very exceptional to see a state advancing a case which doesn't withstand any scrutiny in terms of legitimacy. Normally, one looks at two, three, and four, and in particular four. Mm. But here, um, they, well, they they have become emboldened by the judgment because in the appeal skeleton, they, they do go further and they do seem to say, as I read their skeleton, well, listen, obviously to it. That every, everything that was being advanced by the witness as, in terms of legitimate aim, because everything that's in the detailed grounds is reflected in the evidence too. They're, they're seeking to uphold the judgment. That may be why, but I'm, yes. I'm interested in whether or not this judge judge was encouraged to go down the route he went, or whether in fact he took his own course effectively. Uh, on this point, my, my view submission is that he seems to have taken his own course on that, and that because he was well into the, the thickets of the, the, the parliamentary material, but yeah. he really went on a fact-finding expedition. Mm. Yeah. No, I understand. Uh, your, your real point um, is that whether encouraged by the insurers or not, the judge has gone wrong in paragraph 118. Yes, he, he's gone wrong in paragraph 118 by thinking uh, wrongly that there's some submission here when there isn't as a case, and it's legitimate or it's not legitimate. Uh, and that has to be tested by reference to MWRF. What he, what he has done is substituted his view as to what the legitimate aim of Parliament was in a way that's factually wrong because it's just limited to the two issues, that ignores the 1989 Act, etc., but wasn't, with the greatest respect, his job. He wasn't there to try and identify the legitimate aim of the 97 Act as such. He was there to consider the framework of the 97 Act, the reasons the state were advancing for why in 2020 it continues to interfere with A1P1, and then to test those. By so part of his job is to look at the 97 Act and work out what the social policy was. Just regardless of, of, of materials, and you've already yes. given us a, a trog through of that in section what six it is. Yes. <coughs> um, the one one nine court then says, moreover, 
this is the point about the invidious trap that I find myself in, that the developments happen later, and there's nothing about those. And then um, 120 seems to be an acknowledgement of some legitimacy in the particular components of the legitimate aim about sharing of risk over the insurance industry and the fact that Parliament thinks that the, the missing insurer mischief is better addressed by imposing a liability on whoever's identifiable, etc. But the judge is frankly unpersuaded by all of that. And 121, our complaint really is that all he should really ask himself is, is it manifestly without reasonable foundation in terms of the issue of legitimacy? There's reasonable disagreement as to the aptness of the analogy with other forms of imposing levies on liability insurers. My case was only that it's not dissimilar to other uh, measures or other interventions by the state in the market. That's relevant to considering whether this is so wholly unusual or exceptional that it's obviously out of step with some common sense principle of justice. So I say I'm entitled to point the court to other circumstances in which there's basically just a windfall li liability imposed. Um, this is something Parliament does all the time. The essence of taxation and levying charges, to some extent, is broad brush and not fault based. So, the court has my first complaint, the final limb of it being no, ever, or no suggestion that it considers that it should apply manifestly without reasonable foundation to the question of legitimacy. Is just substituted and disagreed. Then rational connection and here on. The problem is the judge has started in the wrong place. But even in terms of the application of the further limbs, there's no reference to MWRF because it was not applied by the court, and nor was any other exacting or non exacting standard applied either. There was no review at all. This was just pure substitution. And there were further errors in any event. So 124 appears to accept that there's a rational connection to the legitimate aim of increasing revenue. We say that, in fact, we can really justify this on any number of grounds. This could basically just be a pure revenue-raising measure, irrespective of the social balance. Why not Let, impose a levy on the liability insurance industry because this, in the state's view, they can shoulder it. That's what happens. Is that objectionable? There's no singling out. It's what is done to some extent elsewhere. So see the, the DMPS, the Deuce Method for Labour Payment Scheme, etc. You just shift costs on to a section of society that can shoulder them not inherently an affront to common sense. Then 125, and again, this is a point that is, it's not properly stating the, the legitimate aim. So to the extent that the defendant's aim is to meet the cost attributable to a tortious wrongdoing, the absence of a matching scheme does not do that. And that's fine if the Secretary of State was saying, well, we tried to introduce a matching scheme, but we failed, and one can see, therefore, that there might be an issue on rational connection. But the Secretary of State is not saying that she is trying to apply a matching scheme, in the sense as understood by the insurers. state is trying to meet costs in the wide sense of that word, which have a broad brush connection to wrongdoing, a broad brush connection. Well, it would be fair for the judge if he does pick up the wording you used in 115. Yes, um, 
But that needs to be understood in context, because I was not saying to the judge, in the same way that I'm not saying to this court, that um, when we mean meet the costs that are attributable to the tortious wrongdoing, we mean that there has to be some sort of matching scheme corresponding to the common law. The, it, this, the scheme, as enacted, seeks to meet the costs that are attributable, in a very general sense, to tortious wrongdoing. It recovers them from wrongdoers and their insurers, but there is still that very general connection to the tort, because the benefits are payable following the tort. And the insurers say, well, we're not the wrongdoer. But the state says, well, we know you're not the wrongdoer, but you, you stand behind the wrongdoer, and the nexus between you and the wrongdoer is a very clear one. And you've had your premium, and the state's intervened in the market to make EL insurance compulsory, so you've had lots of benefits. So what is so objectionable about you standing behind the wrongdoer when it comes to recovery of benefits? Mm. And one, two, seven, having framed the issues in the way that the court does, then the consequences follow as a matter of logic from the, the court's approach, namely contributory negligence, so no accommodation for contributory negligence. And there is no accommodation for that, because in this scheme, Parliament's decided not to do that. It might do that for NHS charges and things like that, but here it, it hasn't. And one sees, and at one, two, seven... At part E, the court says it's in principle illogical to regard the compensator as having caused the contributory part of the injury. And what the court is saying is that if one looks at this in personal injury terms, because there's contribution and the common law deems the tort visa to have caused the bit which isn't part of the contribution, and that's fine. That's the common law position and the balance of fairness that's been struck by the common law. It's not actually, it's from the 45 Act. Well, my Lord. the common law was um, doctrine of last um, act. Last act, yeah. My Lord. So. Well, you mean by common law the. Um, where we got to. Where we got to <laughs> before all these changes. <laughs> yes. So taking a snapshot before 2006, so the best case for the insurers, we, we then preserve that in aspect as the best balance of fairness that will apply for every purpose. Yeah. So I'm grateful to my Lord. I frankly hadn't appreciated this point, but that's right. We're not even really talking about true common law here. Um, so again, rational connection. The judge says, um, or sets out his view about what is effectively the fair connection, but Nowhere does the judge review the Secretary of State's case on that and test it by reference to MWRF. And I repeat that... But the he's with you. He's with you. Well, um, on uh, contributory negligence, yes, he is at this stage. Um, well, he's right. It's, it's situation two and three where the... Uh, where he disagrees with me then. So two and three, aliquot liability is what he says the scheme should do. To nine, he uh, says, well, you could justify that if you were looking to increase state resources, which we are, because as the witness says, this actually all operates internally within the DWP. We get this money in, we recycle it into spending. Um, so there is some sort of acceptance that, that that would be fine, subject to fair balance. And then 130, he's with me on state benefits, and because of that, I'm not proposing to do anything about it. I'll leave that for the insurers to criticise. And then 
we want. But just to make it clear and fairness to you, it doesn't mean you can't look at the methodology and say it's not the right way of getting it. No, well, it's not the right methodology. It's in your favour, and you're entitled to say that there's no apparent consideration of MWRF. So yes, exactly. Let me be unfair to you. Well, in I'm, that sense. I'm delighted that the judge's view is the same as the Secretary of State, okay. but I agree the logic is really the same here. Um, so it's not his view that's relevant. Then 132, the, the, the fifth situation, which has this shadowy existence in that it's been considered, but on the basis that actually it's not part of the allegations anyway. Um, they were pretty difficult to work out how to do that, which we say is right, and therefore to that extent it's fine to have a non-matching scheme. But you really should have gone further and say, well, where, there is no matching scheme anyway. But does the judge accept then there is a rational connection? Um, in generality, he seems to accept that there's a rational connection in uh, One, the, four and five, but not two and three. Not two, two and three, save for the, the pure legitimate aim component of simply raising revenue, which is part of the legitimate aim. So it is true that this is about striking a, a compromise between different interests, but we say and have always said that the state here is also actually just looking for the cash. It's paid the benefits out. It wants to get them back because it can then recycle them into more social security spending. That's why it's basically a form of taxation. So the judge is accepting um, at para 129. Yes. So you've got through the first two hoops. I got through, but not as um, I would not have liked you wanted to. No, not as I wanted to. And the, the problem is I'm then stuck with uh, revenue raising only at the fourth stage, because nothing else has survived his analysis. Uh, so all I'm left with is fair balance in terms of revenue raising. Then less intrusive measure, no more than is necessary. So uh, we have this debate where I say, well, Parliament's decided how to strike this balance and then taken into account things like the five-year limitation, the, the extent to which um, the certificate terminates, what goes before, etc. So it's decided how to quantify all of this. And when it comes to less intrusive measure in this particular context, you can't say, well, you could have charged them less uh, because that is a less intrusive measure, and therefore you just keep on carving down the amount of the recovery until we get presumably to nil. That's the wrong approach, because the less intrusive measure in this context has to bear in mind that Parliament's decided how much it wants to raise here. So it can't be a less intrusive measure then to try and raise a lesser amount. And you should always say it's a circular argument, but it's not a circular argument, because it's a bit like saying, just to give an example, Parliament's decided that a tax rate of 40% on the liability insurance industry is a legitimate aim for the following reasons. A tax rate of 30% is not a less intrusive way of levying a tax of 40%. It's a different measure entirely. So to try and chip away then at the extent of the obligation is not in truth a less intrusive measure. So it's not a circular argument. One has to have regard to what Parliament's looking to do at the, at the starting point. And here, the, the, the judge records that the insurers actually concede that insofar as we're talking about increasing resources, there is no less intrusive measure or would achieve it less perfectly. Uh, and the, the judge seems to think that's a concession that they shouldn't really have made and that, in fact, in his view, it, there is a less intrusive measure of achieving the amount that Parliament thinks is appropriate. So he expresses his doubts about all of that. But again, it's, there's no MWRF review here. This is the judge basically saying what, in, in his view, would be the 
the least intrusive measure. So does he find you fail here? Um, so as I interpret it then, um, on, on the seven, uh, the judge says, um, let me go back to my notes again. I know, I think you, you, you lose on all five, I think. I think we win on four and five. Yeah, but we, no, we do lose on one, two, and three here. Give me. Yeah, so one, the judge says, I consider this even more strictly. Not sure why. Seems to be to an even more intense standard of review. Yeah. And then he's not persuaded. So we lose one. Can you just give me the paragraph? Yes, 137. 137 Roman 1. Roman 1. Which sentence? Um, I'm not, so D, uh, so. D in the, in the marginal lettering, I'm not persuaded that a scheme taking account of contributed to negligence would be incapable of achieving the scheme's objective. Uh, it follows that the recovery of sums without regard to the scheme would be justified, if at all, only on the basis of a wide range of increasing competent sources. So forgive me, I, I, as I understand it, what then the judge is saying is that we, we still got through by reference to... Well, that's, that's why I asked you, because I, I hadn't read that as yes. you losing on that, but I may be wrong. No, my, my Lord is, is right... What we really look at is fair balance, even here. So he, he accepts no more than is necessary on one. What about two? Well, uh, he's, so two, we've already lost, but we lose again. Why, why have you lost on two? So two and three, so he says, I've already concluded no rational connection. Yeah. And then even if I'm wrong, no less intrusive measure because it would be possible to limit recovery in proportion to the insured's contribution to the overall exposure. Um, now, forgive me. And then, it, 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 then there's again, that they, the, could, yeah, they he, could only be justified on the, ground, on the wider aim of increasing public resources. He, he does. And this is, uh, I, I, my, I am being overly critical in reading all of this and advancing criticisms when, in fact, there are the lines there stating the conclusions. So I, I recognise and accept that. Before you won straight. Yes. So two then he is saying, well, look at the wider aim of increasing public resources. The five you won straight. And what about three? Yes. Three um, goes with two, doesn't it? Yeah, so two and three are the same because they're both adequate liability. He, he doesn't appear, um, he may well be right, that he doesn't find this particular part of the exercise particularly helpful. No. For his ultimate conclusion. He doesn't no. seem to read reach any no. firm or concrete. It's really all about fair balance, and that's yeah. where the substance all of my notes are. So I've perhaps taken this part too quickly, and it, it does require proper um, unpicking. But um, I don't have anything more to say about that. One, three, eight, then fair balance. So there is a, another preliminary point. Now, the court has from SC the, uh, the judgment which makes it clear that for the sake of argument one uses our MWRF, but there it's effectively as part of a composite test and it's a slightly different approach from Bank Menat and the Welshville case which is the structured approach adopted in the judgment which I don't criticise which sets it out in terms of a four-stage classic proportionality exercise. The reasons that there are those two streams of jurisprudence, jurisprudence are set out in DA, which is in the authorities bundle, and I'm not proposing to take the court through that, but if I could just invite the court to have regard to the fact that there was a debate uh, which the Supreme Court has to decide whether there's a composite test of manifestly without reasonable foundation, or whether there's a four-stage test and whether one applies manifestly without reasonable foundation at each of those stages. In my submission, I'm happy to expand on it, the combined effect of DA in the Supreme Court and SC is that fundamentally it doesn't make a difference because DA says that contrary to what Lord Mann said in the Welsh Bill case, manifestly without reasonable foundation, if that's the right approach, applies at all four stages of the process. So there is 
point which I'll make when we look at Welsh Bill, that the approach that Lord Mann's adopted has now, in fact, been superseded by the combined effect of DA and SC in that regard. DA, what, 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 um, can you just give me which divider it's in? Yes, uh, DA is the tab 50. Thank you. And it's in particular paragraph in Lord Wilson's judgment. I'll supply the reference, I'm afraid I've got it in my notes, but Lord Wilson says, manifestly without reasonable foundation at all four stages, let there be no future doubt about it. And that's 65, thank you, uh, in DA. Now, fair balance, paragraph 138, the court sets out uh, uh, points about fair balance. And there's a lot. I think the court's got to take all of it on board and not just knock down all of them, but consider them cumulatively and in the round, because that's the approach the Parliament takes. It's not just a, a sequence of um, points and one decides all of them individually. Parliament takes a view in the round, having regard to a number of features. And what the judge effectively does is to consider all of the many points that we make on fair balance and strike down every single one of them, not on the NWRF approach, but because they do not conform to the paradigm of a matching scheme. So the court does fairly set out in some detail the 10 points which we made below, that's 138, by reference to the case law. And then paragraph 140, and this will really repeat points that I've sought to trail and set up already, uh, but we say the judge was wrong in terms of his evaluation of those in a way that frankly was not even open to him. Um, so the first point being the contemplation point, we say that there's a fallacy, a fallacious approach in terms of trying to work out what was contemplated or not, and that was not a relevant consideration at all. The only factor really in paragraph 140 is the factual point which is, has already been acknowledged by the Dutch, that the interests of the liability insurance industry were in fact taken into account. That's a point that supports my argument, not to the contrary. Sorry, I've just lost the contemplation point. Is it Roman numeral? Yeah, so 140 Roman 1. Yeah. Um, so the oh, I see. It could not have been in part. Yes, thank yes. you. Yeah. Then it's the point about the available materials and the limited intention. And they say there's no indicate, so over the page at 2235, no indication that Parliament's objective in passing the 1997 Act was to address the problem of untraceable employers, insurers. But how does the judge reconcile that with the very clear terms of sections 1 and 6, which do exactly that? So if you're liable to any extent, you are liable for the statutory payment. That's what the statute does. So the, the judge says, well, because I can't see that in the materials, I'm not going to defer to Parliament. Effectively. Now, the court at 141 does accept that it's perfectly legitimate to have what... Uh, is described by the court as ex post facto justification. And in fact, it's not ex post facto justification. I'm justifying this measure as it applies today. What was in contemplation in 1997, 
relevant to the limited extent discussed, but the justification arguments ought to be scrutinized today. So it isn't ex post facto justification at all. And if one's looking at 140, the judge does say that the objective Parliament to the 97 Act was specific, which you say is the impermissible sort of um, reading of Cromwell. Yes. Because we know what Parliament's intention is because we can see it in sections 1 and section 6. Small point in 141, um, I said, well, you don't even have the materials. And in fact, Mr. Towers deals with this in his written statement. It's gone back to the Department of Work and Benches archives. We've got a lot, um, but there's not everything. So even if one was trying to do this exercise of putting oneself in the shoes of the select committee members, you're completely at sea because you don't even have substantial quantities of debates because they can't be traced. So it's an inherently problematic process, even on an evidential basis. And it is treated effectively as something that I need to prove by evidence. And because I can't access some of the materials, then we're, we are prejudiced. Then 142, we have the judge's view on fair balance. So respectfully not reviewing the Secretary of State's view. But there, all the court, in fact, does is simply state the consequences of the legislation. But all of that's known to Parliament. Mm. They say, well, you couldn't price it in, couldn't pass it on. Of course, as I indicated before, if they passed it on, they wouldn't even have a complaint. Could they price it in? Well, the view, the justification argument is they will be able to to some extent. Now, my client doesn't purport or pretend to be active in the underwriting market, so we don't know to what extent they can really pass it on. There's some evidence about bundling the package with the insurance with a package of other forms of insurance. But these are complexities of the marketplace that are being left to the insurers. And there's a very bold assertion from them that, well, we can never price this in. No. But that's not my client's view. Um, and you don't really have any particular underwriting evidence before the court. It's really just put at a, a level of assertion, namely that you've got a policy, um, you've got an impact on that policy, and there's nothing you can do to mitigate it. And we say, well, let's put a look at it in a slightly wider context. You're an insurer, you can have reinsurance arrangements which will mitigate this, as in fact they have done in this case. You can have investment decisions in terms of your assets, which will take account of all of that. Um, if you can't pass it on, and ultimately you're sitting with an overhead, then yes, you are sitting with an overhead. But Parliament knows that. And that's your contribution back to the state. Then 143, so of course we end up losing on situation one, contributory negligence. The court acknowledges the fact that this went before Parliament and that there was consideration about the particular problem of contributory negligence which resulted in Parliament deciding not to legislate to deal with that. And then the court says, however, such evidence as exists tends to suggest that the approach was taken for essentially practical reasons. And that's no doubt absolutely right. But what's wrong with that? Why can Parliament not take an approach for essentially practical reasons? In what sense is that manifestly without reasonable foundation? And the court says... Well, it's in, you. in a sense, reading 143 and the fact that he says in terms, he, he refers to that approach being taken for essentially practical reasons and was not for the court to criticise Parliament's approach, and I do not do so. He then goes on to form his own view and doesn't actually, in that context, apply the manifestly without reasonable foundation test at all, if anything. He, that paragraph demonstrates the precise opposite, that he hasn't applied it. Yes, 
Absolutely so. It's gone off on a, you know, I don't mean this rudely, but frolic of his own, um, without actually addressing whether or not the, the measure was manifesting, or the decision not to include contributory negligence was somehow manifesting without reasonable foundation. Yes. That's precisely right. And he's not criticised the Parliament, but that, that doesn't found uh, a basis for then what follows, as my lord has put it just now. Yeah. And um, so we, we lost then on contributory negligence, see the end of 143. And 144, responding to my point two. It's, it's, it's an interesting phrase. I conclude justification has not been shown for the scheme. Yes. So um, it's an evidential burden. What, um, it's the way the judge seems to adopt. It's approach with it, namely that I failed because I haven't evidenced it effectively. And we say it's not really properly described as evidential or burden as such, the evaluative judgment that the court makes. And 144, we say, as part of the overall fair balance, see the placement of contributions next to tax. This is not a, a tax in a general sense. It's, in fact, a far more nuanced way of revenue raising. So it is a species of tax. So there's an analogy in a general sense. And tax is an area where fair balance will very much be left to the views of national authorities, the first instance, and parliament in the, in the domestic level. So we say that, properly understood, it is um, a revenue-raising measure where there is a, a very wide margin. And we don't need to show very much uh, in terms of uh, parliamentary intention and justification in, in terms of why Parliament is taxing in the way that it is. General taxation, the, the court properly recognises that if it's general taxation, then it's going to be very difficult for the claimants to mount a sensible argument because of the legitimate aim of raising public finance. And then more directly, taxation of industry sectors may also satisfy the fair balance test on a similar basis and or on the basis that they relate to costs arising from that sector in particular as in the MIB and DMPS examples. By contrast, measures such as those involved in the present case which target particular entities are unlikely to satisfy the test simply on public fundraising grounds. A fair balance is unlikely to be struck by such targeted measures unless the individual burden can be regarded as fair in the light of particular circumstances appertaining to the targeted entities, such as costs fairly attributable to their activities. So we say respectfully that that is going very far into the realm of policy making as to what taxation <laughs> can properly do and how taxation can properly be uh, targeted and implemented. I wonder Respect whether, sorry, no, sorry, I thought you finished. You oh, my Lord, sorry, but so it says targeted entities. This isn't a bank mellet analogy where there's one Iranian bank out of 12 which has been subject to the measure. There's no targeting of Swiss re and Aviva. This is a, a decision to tax a, a sector of, of society. So we say this isn't properly described as a targeting measure. But in any event, what is the basis for all that striking statement of policy in the final five lines about costs attributable to activities? Well, and also, it seems, I just wonder whether this is inconsistent with Lord Hope's two reasons that he gives. One is that if you've insured the talk, Peter, then that's the reason you've been targeted. Well, 
yes, there's all sorts of targeting in matters of taxation and strategy. A windfall tax, which simply imposes a tax, for example, on the energy sector, because they're perceived to have made excess profits, has got nothing to do with any costs that they visited on society. What the state does is target them because, in the view of the state, they can pay. Nothing wrong with that. The state does. So find your tax where you can. And this is simply an example of that. But it is, a, in fact, a more nuanced and a more sophisticated scheme. So when we say, well, here, we could just have taxed them. In fact, what we've chosen to do is something which is actually a lot more sophisticated, recovery of compensation schemes, five-year limits and things like that. That doesn't give the, the court more room to review it. On the contrary, it, it demonstrates that the court has done something which is nuanced and balanced. Sorry, the Parliament has done something which is nuanced and balanced, properly considering all of the various interests. So we would say on the, the other principle, if there was a Strasbourg principle that said you can't tax unless it's attributable to costs you've caused on society, then there would be a case that says that in Strasbourg. But there isn't. <coughs> and one four six three, the judge respectfully disagrees with the, the evidence that we say. Well, there, there might be some passing on. We don't know how much, but there'll probably be some. So we have some mitigation. The court says no, cannot be done. There is no way in which the insurance industry can ever price this cost of business into their general activities. I don't know, I'm not an insurer, but the view of the Secretary of State and the State is that there will be scope for doing this, and that was a view reached having spoken to the Association of British Insurers, taken evidence into account. We say respectfully that it is an overly simplistic statement in terms of the market and the, the trade of an underwriter. We know they operate in a competitive market, and Parliament knows all of that. We know that there might be some sort of disadvantage. And we know that ultimately, there will be costs that simply get absorbed. But the insurers needed to go a lot further than this, simply stating that, well, this is, puts us at a disadvantage doesn't mean that Article 151 has been violated. They've got to demonstrate how. And then we have this slightly interesting but curious evidence at 147 about how somebody went out of business many years ago, Iron Trade Mutual, mm -hmm. Chester, it's Chester Street, no, it's the same entity as Chester Street Insurance Holder. We don't know if they were writing their policies poorly, whether they were paying excessive distributions to their shareholders or bonuses. You don't know on the evidence before the court? No, we don't on the evidence. <laughs> Some of us well, know more about it than this paragraph reveals. My Lord, um, <laughs> note it. I'm afraid I don't. Uh, I know what's Likewise, in the Likewise, independent insurance, I think, is referred to elsewhere. But um, you're absolutely right. There's not... Um, yes. There's nothing... Well, um, well material before the court. All we say is, well... True, they, they've gone out of business, but um, Swiss Re, let's recall, have stepped into this market. Well, I mean, they're, they're, we can take judicial notice of the fact that there was, because it's referred to elsewhere, that there was a crisis in the in, in employer's liability insurance um, of around, um, not around the time, I think really when this statute came into force, around that time, end of the 90s, beginning of the 2000s. That would tend so whether, to whether that um, is of any relevance yes. to this issue is a different question altogether. Well, absolutely so. Um, so, certainly for my part, it would be complete speculation as to how their misfortunes arose. Is it attributable to something the state has done? I don't know. Um, but it doesn't really tell us very much about Viva and Swiss Re, bearing in mind that human rights are personal rights. 
and bearing in mind that Swiss Reed do not consider themselves to be at any competitive disadvantage because they've come into this with their eyes open in 2015, no doubt thinking they can make a profit. But this was all addressed to your apparent submission that industry had adhered without difficulty to the yeah. scheme since its inception. Yes, so we so said... Effectively, if you were relying on that, you were inviting this sort of... Well, that's true, but industry, uh, industry is... All, all they could come up with is iron trades and say, well, turn of the century, they went bust and they had a, a very heavy book of DL policies, um, to which we say, well, they've not bought a claim, and um, if, if that was visited upon them by the state, then there would be a very clear evidential trail. We don't know what the reasons for that are. It might be partly something to do with the 97 Act, but we suspect it's probably unlikely. I appreciate the court has much greater visibility of all of this. Um, if, but in any event, if they're saying this is something to do with the, the whole industry, that here this is inevitably going to be ruinous, then why is it, has it not been ruinous? Because that's what the witness is saying, saying that the liability insurance industry continues to trade profitably. They've done what Parliament thought they would, which is shoulder the cost and carry on making lots of money, which is obviously something to be encouraged. Um, no, they would say, well, their profits would probably be higher if they didn't have statutory liabilities. But we are some way away from an unjustifiable A1P1 interference then. Yes, the court says, well, um, 148, it can't confidently assume that what I said was in fact necessarily well founded about how they managed to deal with all of this. But uh, the reality is that we, we stand by that submission. The, the view of the Secretary of State, which has to be considered as part of the balance, is look at the market, look at what's actually happening in 2021. Have we really wreaked um, real ruin? upon the liability insurance industry by this measure? No, nothing of the sort. But w when we look at the summary of the, um, you know, everybody makes a very detailed and careful judgment under fair balance, if I look over to the way you put it in writing anyway, yes. page 293 of your written skeleton, you say that, again here, what is missing from the summary of your arguments is WMR, WMRF at the beginning. Yes. Um, but page 293, paragraph 104, you start your submissions by reference to that test. But I suppose the judge had earlier effectively said, well, that doesn't apply at the full, at the full stage. And yes, he, he, he'd said that. So he wasn't applying MWRF, even if he were. Yeah. I would still be appealing on the basis that properly directing himself to MWRF, he could not properly have balanced all of those and concluded that they were. MWRF, and this court would be entitled to return on that basis. Why do I say that? Because they obviously are reasonable when considered individually and cumulatively. And we just have a series of disagreements, but a lot of them are not well founded. Then four point about the costs. So you Judge said, not persuaded about the costs. It is respectfully a slightly arid part of the exercise because it is true that we had a witness statement which says actually Parliament's basically got the numbers right. So if it is relevant to look at the, the contemplation in terms of cost, the numbers are, ac are accurate. And then we've got a debate about whether they are or aren't accurate, and the court says they're not. Uh, but the way that it does so is um, because of increased payments to in injured persons, as the described six lines are. I, my short point in response to all that, without trying to unpick who's right and who's wrong about the numbers, is that it doesn't matter. Parliament gave some thought to the additional costs, thought they were in the tens of millions. We say that they are in the tens of millions. The insurers say that they're in excess of the tens of millions, but Parliament knows all that. Then five, uh, Roman five at 150. 
consideration of what we would describe as the mitigatory factors in the fair balance exercise, and they're all rejected. So the five-year rule operates to limit insurers' liabilities, and it is true that the state bears numerous ongoing burdens arising from long-tailed diseases. Absolutely critical point. And then the court says, as the claimants point out in mesothelioma cases, sadly, life expectancy is far shorter of five years. And that the five years isn't part of a fair balance. So there's a pre-existing feature. But why? It's a pre-existing feature that's also part of the fair balance. But more fundamentally, what of the state bearing numerous ongoing burdens arising from long tail diseases? For example, the cost of the NHS... Yeah, and, and the costs of economic inactivity on the part of injured victims and those who care for them. And the judge only really deals with the five-year point. He doesn't deal with any of the rest at all. Uh, we say that the first sentence on its own is well capable of founding justification for this, namely that the, these are costs that have been caused by tort visas on society, Insurers have sufficient proximity to tort visas to justify payment from them. We're not even trying to recover your true costs. We're just getting a proportion. Then 151, um, no special justification. And this is unsurprising. The courts found there's no justification at all anyway for the absence of a matching scheme. So unsurprisingly, there's no special justification for being retrospective. And he says, in any event, what Parliament meant when Hansard refers to in the pipeline, and we saw that in Lord Mackay's comments to the House of Lords, is that he says that things that as I understand it, in the pipeline in 97, so cases that are likely to emerge shortly after 1997. But there's no reason to think it's so narrow when one looks at the actual statute, which makes the scope of the retrospectivity point absolutely clear. And then here, um, so... AXA and Lord Mance. And I accept there's a slightly different point raised by AXA in this regard as to what the retrospectivity is and about changes in the, the nature of the insured liabilities that might have been reasonably in contemplation. But that doesn't mean that you can't have retrospectivity in the sense that has been set out here since 1989. Because if the scheme is looking to recover costs that are already arising and latent costs that are going to arise in due course as the claims merge, as this scheme is doing, then for the reasons that have previously been outlined, it has to operate retrospectively. And the approach that the Strasbourg Court says in fact that one takes is that you look at the social policy aim. Is this social remedial legislation looking to reverse or address some issue that arises retrospectively, because if it is, that provides you with the special justification for legislating in that way, because otherwise you simply can't do what Parliament clearly wants to do. Then, um, point taking issue with what I had said by reference to Lord Hope and taking the rough with the smooth, and I accept that the, the comments made in AXA and Lord Hope's comments there are in a different context, and what Lord Hope is describing is a different sort of taking the rough with the smooth. Um, but it doesn't mean that the expression is wholly inapt here, because one is still looking at the liability insurance industry in general terms. They do operate in a sector of the economy which is uniquely placed to evaluate and predict things that might happen in the future. Now, they'll say, oh, we can't predict this. Come on, you're asking a bit much. That's not really the point here. This is a point, really, of identifying the nature of the industry who um, the measure is being subjected to. 
and just considering what can they reasonably uh, bear that burden. This is the insurance industry. We're not imposing this on school teachers or somebody with no connection to the issues in question here. There's a very logical reason why the insurance industry is being required to pay this levy. And they are in the business of forecasting, making investment decisions, doing things which will mean that they can respond to the measure which the state thinks is appropriate. So respectfully, we say that they're not in a, any different position. One takes into account their characteristics of who they are, because that's a relevant factor in the round alongside everything else. It's the same with energy companies, banks, whoever it may be. Just look, look at them and see what their, their standing is. And that is a relevant factor to consider when deciding whether they can bear the burden. There's, there's nothing in the Strasbourg case law that says that you can't do that. And the same point really in 155156, adopting the insurer's complaint that they, they didn't see this coming and how could they? And not only that, it's all got a lot worse since Fairchild. But I've made my points on all of that. In 157, we respectfully say it's wrong. The court says the first or third aspects of the 1997 Act identified in paragraph 11 and above do not address any equivalent social injustice. There are aspects which benefit the state while conferring no additional benefit on injured claimants. And that's by reference to what's being said in, by Lord Home but it fundamentally misunderstands the role of social policy in schemes of this nature in striking a balance to the benefit of all. So when the judge says, well, this benefits the state, well, that's part of the... Well, so it's the same error. Yes. He comes on to commit in relation to your point eight. Yes. He, does, he fails to recognise that remedial social legislation includes social legislation which, in which money is paid to the state by, in this instance, the insurers, yes. so that we, the general body of the taxpayers, don't have to bear that, that burden. In the, indeed. That must be remedial social legislation. Absolutely so. One is bringing in arguments from beverage, arguments from uh, common law, the balance of fairness, uh, difficult issues, divided views, consensus emerges, the, the idea that this is not social policy legislation is simply wrong. And then 159, the point, point 0.8, it's not social remedial legislation because it doesn't correspond to the matching scheme. And four lines above the extract from Equitas, so this is just above letter C, there are no such pressing social concerns in the present case as may constitute special justification for retrospective legislation. So you're all simply not right. And then there's a reference to Lord Justice Mail's in Equitas, which the court says is pertinent, but all that's talking about is Common law. We're not going I may, to. I may still be rather sore about what you said in Equus House, but <laughs> I can't, for the life of me, see what the relevance of either of those passages is to what to what we have to decide. I mean, the the, 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 the second passage is is a perfectly valid point which Lord Hoffman made about Fairchild. Yeah. That um, the unorthodoxy of the Fairchild enclave should be limited to itself and not be extended further. And whatever we agrees with that. Yes. But I don't see what the relevance of that is to whether or not this is social remedial legislation. No. Um, there we are. Well, that, that point is that the twists in terms of the common law are irrelevant here. Yeah. It's Parliament settled at the door of the Supreme Court. <laughs> they had a chance to look at it. Yes. <laughs> so. Well, just as well. Really. Yeah. Um, and that's that's how these things go. Um, so. 
yeah. a misdirected point and substantially overstates why the common law has anything to do with any of this, because it doesn't. Absolutely. Roman 9 rejects again our argument, well, what about the swings and roundabouts, the missing insurers and employers? Yeah. You've had your premium for those. Um, so why should you, liability industry, not pay? Not saying uh, Aviva, I don't know, but in some cases it, it is Aviva. Perfectly rational alongside everything else and in, independently. Um, but I recognise that if a matching scheme is mandatory, then well, I see the point, but it isn't. So what's the deal then with Welsh Bill case? Um, I hope, does my law say 10 past four? Or? Yeah. If I do that, then I'm basically there on ground one, and grounds two to eight are fairly quick for tomorrow. Well, the real question is whether we need to sit at 10 tomorrow. Um, I well, need... I see my colleagues are ready to yeah. sit at 10. Yeah. I think it wouldn't be a bad idea. Yeah. Not criticising no. you at all, but I think it would be a good idea if we sat at ten, because then at least we'd, we'd maintain that rule of school. So you go on for another five minutes or so. But I really do need to rise to ten past. Yes. Well, Welsh bill then. Um, its authorities tab thirty-eight. Two issues before the Supreme Court on a reference directly from the Welsh Assembly. So which uh, tab thirty-eight of the authorities? Bundle three. So, some broad analogy, of course, I recognise that, but um, the legal significance is what one needs to consider. Two issues before the Supreme Court, was it within the legislative competence established by the Government of Wales Act 2006? That's the point on which the court determined it. And then, was it compliant with A1P1? Not necessary to decide it, but some views expressed. So, over to comments on A1P1. Not the same scheme, so different scheme. NHS charges, not Social Security. We've got some aspects of it in the judgment, but we don't know what the overall balance is and whether, in terms of limitations on liability within the scheme, whether there's any financial caps, or <coughs> five year caps, or anything like that. works in a different way, so it establishes primary and secondary liability. If one looks at paragraph 36 of Lord Mance's judgment, rather than here, two sets of primary liability. And before I take the court to Lord Mance's judgment, I, I note that we don't actually know what the Government of Wales' justification case was, but what appears from paragraph 30 of Lord Mance's judgment doesn't appear to be the same as the United Kingdom government's justification defence in respect of social security costs as arises in this appeal. This was a proposed draft bill being considered by a non-sovereign parliament. See paragraph 56 of Lord Mance's opinion which notes that Article 9 of the Bill of Rights does not apply, or at least arguably does not apply to such a bill. Sorry, paragraph? Paragraph 56. 56 and then note from paragraph 45, Lord Mance does not apply the MWRF test at the full stage, and the court has my submissions that that should be treated now as not being the correct approach when Sorry, paragraph 45, did you say? Yes. 45. Yeah, so four stages. Um, yeah. And then there's the, then 46, Lord Mance records the submission that MWRF doesn't apply at the fourth stage. Is not now properly a statement of the law. See also 52. Yeah. Then 
the application on the present reference is from paragraph 57. So the bill engages A1P1, so a point was taken by the general counsel that A1P1 wasn't engaged, and I haven't, don't take that point. Um, so we don't actually know what the legitimate aim is that's being advanced. Um, the court really goes straight to the arguments about the balance, fundamentally, and the retrospective imposition of me measures. So this is very much considered from the prism of insurance contracts. And so just going back, I'm sorry, to Mr. Fordham's submission, the court is at paragraph 46. Yes. So 46. It's not, it's not, there's no reference to the authorities upon which Mr. Fordham, as he then was, relied. No. Um, it doesn't matter given what we now know from DA no. All right. and SC. So hopefully we can leave that part of the debate. Then the application starts off at 57, but in, and there's references to retrospectivity, etc. Then it's 63, really. We've got some contrasting with the Scottish statute and what appears to be some rather narrow justification arguments that are being considered by the court, which are not the same as those before this court. Um, and what the Lord Mount says, what I think respectfully seems to fortify the court in this case is that this that bill was not properly described as social remedial legislation. So contrast at 63A with the Scottish statute. But again, it's saying that that's because it's um, primarily looking at the position of asbestos suffer, asbestosis sufferers and doesn't really take into account the more fundamental point, because it doesn't look like it was run, about why this is actually a social balance in a very wide and profound sense. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to complete this in two well, minutes. Let, let us come back to it to the words for tomorrow. Yes. And then we look forward to hearing your submissions fairly soon. Um, so if we say 10 o'clock, and just a reminder, we, I think we have to rise at 3 tomorrow. Yeah. We'll start at 10 and then get in one hour. Hopefully we'll... Thank you. Can't rise. Thank you.